Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Dr. Jeffrey D. Gross. Dr. Gross, MD, is a renowned and internationally recognized expert in regenerative medicine, biomedical optics, artificial intelligence, and biocomputing. He is one of the first spine fellowship trained neurological surgeons and one of only a handful of specialists to apply regenerative medicine to address spinal problems. He has practiced for over 23 years, treating thousands of patients, pressing conservative, non-surgical, and cutting-edge biological treatment first and foremost. His upcoming book, Young Again, is a practical how-to for the anti-aging and anti-disease enthusiast. Please welcome to the Biohacker Live World Summit stage, Dr. Jeffrey D. Gross. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here at the Biohacker University. This is quite an honor and a pleasure. And I hope I can leave you with a little information on how to biohack your back and neck pain. First of all, why does the spine hurt? We can't help it if we, doesn't, if we don't understand fully why we have problems with it. The spine is made up of a series of mechanical joints. One of those joints involves what's called the disc that many of us have heard about. But there are also joints in the back of the spine called the facet joints. These joints sustain trauma, cumulative trauma, all day long, in addition to probably more accelerated traumas from car accidents, work accidents, and other types of problems. As such, they accumulate all kinds of degenerative change, which causes inflammatory pathways within the cell, and that leads to pain, both mechanically and chemically. Now, the spine has a normal cushioning disc. That's a healthy disc. It also has joints in the back called facet joints. But with this degeneration, uh, you can see an example. The disc loses its height, it forms bone spurs, and the nerves can get involved. So there are many sources of pain coming from the spine as it is injured and accumulates daily degenerative forces and degeneration and becomes inflamed. But the discs and joints work together. A normal disc uh, uh, keeps the two bones adjacent, and these are vertebral bones apart, and that's, that's called a vertebral joint. It involves a bone above, a bone below, and the disc in between. Also involved in the vertebral interactions are those facet joints in the back of the spine, as you can see here. These work together. Now I have an example of an MRI, and these are images of the lower back in this case, showing the disc, which is dark in this between the two bones, which are lighter in color. And on an MRI, you can see the bone marrow. It's a gray, kind of irregular uh, uh, form. Uh, but you can see what happens when a disc degenerates on the right of the screen. A dark and degenerated disc is felt in the vertebral bones just above and below the disc. And this means as the disc loses its cushioning power, its ability to, to withstand force, the bone marrow above and below gets angry and cranky and inflamed, and this starts the degenerative cascade of the spine, and from it causes pain. Ouch. Now, you may have heard the term or the phrase degenerative disc disease. Now, this really isn't a disease. It's not a great phrase, but it does refer to these accumulated uh, vertebrogenic stresses, spinal stresses across the disc and these degenerative changes, and it's a vicious cycle. The more degeneration you have in the spine, the more it degenerates. Now if you look closer at the disc, it's made up of two different structures. The pink structure is the cushioning part of the disc called the nucleus pulposus. And as we withstand weight all day and bend side to side, it's sort of a biological ball bearing structure that stays in the center and keeps us, it keeps our spine withstanding these forces. Around the outside of that pink area are these multiple tough rubber band like fibrous ring structures called the annulus. Just like the sun, just like we travel around the sun and that's one annual, these fibers are called the annulus. And they, they keep that pink nucleus in its place. And over time and with degeneration, the annulus can withstand tears and fissures, which allows the nucleus to come out, and that leads to a herniated disc. There are many chemical structures involved in this and enzymes that keep this disc moist 
and keep the entire disc moist. And th that moisture deal it causes more cushioning power, just like your kitchen sponge. A wet kitchen sponge is moist. You can bend it. It's flexible. But if you've been on vacation, you come home and there's a dry sponge, it's hard and brittle. Obviously, we want a more moist and cushioning disc, and that's called the viscoelastic power of the disc. And would you, would you believe the disc is mainly made up of water? So we want it moist. And over time, as it degenerates and with accumulated trauma, as it degenerates, it becomes more inflamed, and that's where more pain comes from. Now, the disc does contain some proteins, mo most of them involving collagen to some degree. And those proteins ac accumulate water. So the healthier those proteins, the more those proteins, the more water we have in the disc, and and the, the healthier, more squishy the disc is, and that's what we want. Interestingly, the nucleus, the disc itself, has very few cells. So it's not a cellular structure, it's a rather a hypocellular organ. However, its nutrients come from, would you believe, the bone above and below. So back to what we showed on the MRI, why does the bone get cranky when the disc isn't working? It's because the, this, the source of the disc, the health of the disc, is coming from its, its home. Its home is the vertebral end plates, the bone just adjacent to the disc, and we need to focus the health on that unit. Also, the blood supply to a disc is mainly through the bone above and below, and here's a great picture of that. Oxygen, nutrition, everything comes from the blood supply and the nerve supply, which is all in the bones adjacent and surrounding a disc. So really, our disc health is a measure of our vertebral end plate health, our vertebral bone health. But these aren't just structures. There's also a subcellular and microscopic component. And the more degeneration we have in a disc, uh, the more inflammatory activities we have on a biochemical level. And, these, and the very approaches I'll talk to you about addressing this through regenerative medicine for the spine come from addressing a lot of these inflammatory cascades and reprogramming them, turning them off, and going from degeneration to the opposite, regeneration. Now, um, inside a painful disc, um, this degeneration, as I mentioned, does involve these, these subcellular processes. Uh, many programming, genes expressed, uh, mitochondrial activity, activity deal with inflammation. If we can reverse those programmings, then we're, we're making strides towards regenerating the spine. But let's take a minute and, and talk about age of the spine and age in general. And although this talk is focused on the spine, th these, these topics and techniques apply to any part of the body because all the organs and other joints and in fact, diseases of age are really diseases of inflammation. So again, addressing these, these inflammatory uh, factors, suppressing them or reversing them into an anti-inflammatory state is an anti-aging state because really age is accumulated inflammation. We can have the same temporal age, meaning two people can both be 70, but their, their biology, their physiology can be very different, and that becomes more apparent as temporal age increases. Now here's an example of two different MRIs of the lower back. On the left, you see a healthy low back MRI. The discs in between the bones are the bright structures, and bright on this type of MRI shows hydration, shows water content. These are the moist, squishy discs. This is what we want. The bone marrow looks healthy. Now look in contrast on the right of the screen, and what you see are degenerated discs, and the bone marrow gets cranky above and below some of those discs. You have loss of the disc height. You have loss of the water, and they turn darker on this type of MRI. You can also see multiple slipping discs causing narrowing, or what we call stenosis, of the spine, and that's where the nerves get involved. And that's why someone with a neck problem can develop tingling, pain, or weakness down the arm and hand. Same for the lower back. It can involve the lower extremity, the leg, the foot, what have you. But there's good news. And ho hopefully, if we address this early enough and give it a good attempt, we can address this without long-term need for medications, hopefully not with steroid injections on an ongoing basis, although sometimes these can be necessary, and hopefully without surgery. And that's the main goal. Because reducing inflammation uh, reduces degeneration and leads us to a path towards regeneration. And with regeneration, hopefully, 
pain reduction. So how do we biohack that? Well, there are a few ways to attack that, and that's really finally getting into what we're talking about here. And first, there's lifestyle changes, and these are anti-inflammatory epigenetics. These types of things, as, as we've learned from many talks here at the Biohacking University, deal with what we can influence in terms of what genes are being expressed in our cells, because we want to downplay the inflammatory cascade and work on cellular metabolism that is anti-inflammatory. And that involves a diet, and it's not just what we eat, but it's when we eat it, vitamins and supplements that we may be deficient in or could use more of, muscle mass support, which I'll talk to you about in a moment, and bone density. Other things we can do specific for the spine involve postural support, decompression, flexibility, and regenerative biologics. So it always, it always puzzled me that a three-year-old can scrape its knee and two days later you rip off the Band-Aid, the scab is gone. How come we can't heal like that? I, I bump my arm and two weeks later the bruise is still is just resolving. How can we get the cellular healing as a, as, as a young person? Well, this is, this is the basis of regenerative medicine. And this involves activating those anti-inflammatory pathways. And for the spine to start acti activating those pathways, first we want to reduce the amount of poor posture. Now that sounds simple, S you know, stand up straight, just as your mother may have told you. But in this case, we, we sit all day long, uh, many of us. We, we sit at a desk or we sit in a vehicle. Um, we, we, we bend improperly and repetitively. We should take every opportunity, and here's an example of, of some, some items you can purchase on Amazon for your vehicle, to, 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 to support the curves of the spine, the normal curves of the spine. Now this won't fix everything, but it, at least it stops some of the ongoing poor postural damage that stresses the facet joints and it, inadvertently stresses the discs. And then there's muscular support, building up the muscle mass of the spine. This should be part of our normal exercise and workout. It's as simple for the lower back as doing what's called a Superman exercise, which activates the paraspinal muscles in the lumbar spine that go up and down along the spine. And for the neck, extension exercises, pushing the neck and head backwards against resistance uh, repetitively to build up the neck muscles in the back. You may ask, why don't we have to build up the neck muscles in the front? Because all day long, we're using them forward. They don't need any building. We need to work on the antidote muscles behind them. And this will help support the posture if the muscles are built up. And muscular bulk provides more uh, nutrients to the discs, more nutrients to the vertebra. For patients already with spinal problems, decompression or taking the, the gravity off the spine can help sometimes also lessen some of the problems felt that are degenerative to the both discs and facet joints and other pain generators of the spine. But really, for those patients that already have too many problems, too much accumulated inflammation and degeneration, we turn to regenerative medicine for a, a real kick in the pants for anti-inflammatory activity. And this, this can be to uh, deal with disc problems, facet joint problems, mechanical, muscular, uh, various problems of the spine and, and other places of the body. So what are the targets of the spine? Well, starting with disc problems, again, the discs have relatively no cells, minimal cell structure. They don't supply their own blood. They don't have nutrients. The source of that, what grows the disc are the nearby vertebral bones. So the target is addressing the bone marrow above and below each disc. And for disc regeneration, Biologics are the key to be delivered to the vertebral end plates. And that's done through a needle under sedation. And biologics, which I'll talk to you about in just one moment, uh, can be delivered right, targeted to the areas and the specific end plates that give rise to the collagen production, the anti-inflammatory anti cellular cascade of the bone marrow and stem cells lying dormant in the vertebral bodies especially as we age. They need to be awakened, activated, and uh, turned on. It's also very interesting that, that in uh, fetuses who undergo surgery for spina bifida, where they are treated in the womb, when they are later delivered, they have minimal if no scarring. There's something very special about the contents of amniotic fluid in the womb, and this is part of what we leverage through regenerative medicine. Um, what is in amniotic fluid? Well, it's got abundant and the most youthful stem cells you can find. 
It's got proteins, collagen, growth factors, and extracellular vesicles. And these are called exosomes. They are given off by stem cells. And we, we call these types of stem cells MSCs or mesenchymal stem cells. And these vesicles are cell-to-cell -cell signaling uh, products. The one cell uh, gives off. It's got a membrane, but it's not a cell. It's a very small particle. It goes to the next cell. It's, it's imbibed within that cell. And the contents of that exosome are delivered and shares information, programming information, from one cell to another, from a stem cell to a stem cell, from a stem cell to a non-stem cell or a differentiated cell to say, turn on that anti-inflammatory slash regenerative activity. Sources of exosomes can be from platelet-rich plasma. It can be from stem cells themselves and, and in a more concentrated non-cellular form from amniotic fluid purified down into just the extracellular vesicles. Here's an example of an exosome. A cartoon, it shows it contains mRNA and growth factors and some of the good heat shock proteins, not the bad ones. And these are very primitive proteins that support anti-inflammatory cellular activities, regeneration, and in the big picture, hopefully, uh, telling a vertebral bone to turn on that disc regeneration mode. Now, these are just standard exosomes. They're just the beginning. Soon we will have tissue-specific, designer, enhanced exosomes. This, these are in the works, and they are coming. Now, this isn't new. Uh, there have been uh, doctors in, uh, injecting stem cells into discs for some time, uh, although I, I prefer the vertebral bone method for a better delivery, and this has been proven in some of the knee literature. Uh, the early work in spine is still just in the discs. Um, and this, here's an example of a, a result of an intradiscal stem cell. I believe this MRI on the right was taken one year after the MRI on the left. And you can see in picture A, the darkened discs at the lower two discs called L4-5 and L5-S1 have become rehydrated in time uh, on the right image B after stem cell injections. And of course, with this were good clinical results. That means someone felt better. And, the, and, those, and this has been done at multiple centers, and it shows disc rehydration. It's the only thing I know that's shown disc rehydration and improved viscoelasticity, which is the cushioning property of discs. There are also ways to address the facet joints and other pain generators of the spine. And this is how we take patients with back and neck pain and help them use their own cells to heal their own spines. And this is the, this is the now. This is not just the future. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk here at the Biohacking University. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. If, if there's any way I can help, I would love to do so. Please reach out, and uh, thank you very much.